Podcast. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. This is another special Wednesday morning episode brought to you by our new sponsor, Jeremy Clevenger Fitness, who we featured on last week's episode. If you haven't heard that episode, I encourage you to go back and take a listen. I have another great show lined up for you, but before we get started, I just wanted to mention my latest leadership book. It's called You Have the Watch, and it's available on my website and on Amazon. It's a number one new release and a bestseller on Amazon, and I'm really excited about this new book because it's not actually a book. It's a guided journal for leaders that will take you through an entire year of leadership training. There are 50 themes in the book, and each day you'll reflect on a different facet of that theme. This journal is designed to be on your desk at work for you to read and reflect on for about 15 minutes each morning, and leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them, and this journal helps you practice those skills. So if you're interested in this guided journal, go to youhavethewatch.com or Amazon and pick up your copy today. Now, if you're looking for other ways to support what I do on this show, visit any one of my sponsors and purchase any one of my books at johnsrenny.com. Podcast listeners can use the discount code DEEP at checkout for additional savings. Also, I just wanted to mention that Deep Leadership is now ranked in the top 2.5% most popular shows out of 3 million podcasts globally, according to Listen Score. And we're also closing in on the top 100 management podcasts ranking in the U.S. So I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for listening and sharing these episodes every week with your friends. You have helped this podcast grow into a top performing show. So thank you very much. Today, we're going to be talking about how to lead quietly and effectively in an otherwise loud and obnoxious world. My guest is Ian Roth, and Ian is an Army officer, and he's the author of a new book called Shut Up and Lead, How to Speak Softly and Carry a Big Stick in a Loud and Obnoxious World. Now, he's going to help us understand how to be a quiet and competent leader that gets things done despite all the noise around us. This was a fun discussion that I know you're going to enjoy. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ian Roth. Ian is an active duty U.S. Army officer who has been leading teams for the past 15 years in both the military and in the civilian sectors. He writes about leadership issues and has a new book coming out in January called Shut Up and Lead, How to Speak Softly and Carry a Big Stick in a Loud and Obnoxious World, which I love the title of. And so I wanted to get him on the show and talk about this new book and his views about how to be effective as a leader in a world that is loud and obnoxious. So Ian, welcome to the show. John, thanks for having me. I'm glad you find some humor in the title. I I tend to be a sarcastic person, but the title just resonates with me and it sounds just kind of from your reaction that, that it resonates with you too. Well, I am a veteran and we're, I, I am, you know, I'm, I speak fluent sarcasm. So yeah, maybe that's why it resonates. <laughs> so. that, that's the true sign of a real veteran is the sarcastic language that we share among one another. Absolutely. Yes. hundred percent. So um, yeah, maybe we'll start off, t- t- talk to us a little bit about um, why you joined the, the army in the beginning and uh, kind of some of the, the, the things you did in the army. And I know you did, you spent nine months in Afghanistan as well as part of your service so far. So tell us a little bit about, you know, why did you join and what kind of things have you done so far? So what made me join wanted to be an air force fighter pilot. I think <laughs> after seeing Top Gun, you know, the yeah. first Top Gun, which isn't even the Air Force, like, I want to fly jets. And my dad was like, yeah, that'd be great to do. Uh, so I wanted to go to school and they said, we can't give you free school. And the army building next door was like, we can give you free school. So I'm like, dad, I think I'm going to go with those guys. Uh, but all kidding aside, I was 12 years old when 9-11 happened. I remember watching yeah. it happen, the, the second tower live on TV. And, and that was the moment I knew that I wanted to serve my country and whatever capacity they would allow me to do that. So from that point onward, I knew I wanted to have some sort of career in the military, did army ROTC at Ohio university for your program commissioned as a second lieutenant into the national guard, 
was in the National Guard Army Reserve for about eight and a half years. And in 2017, the Army opened up the floodgates and said, hey, we need some officers. I applied to what's called the call to active duty program, was accepted and went into active duty service with the 101st Airborne Division in 2017. So a little bit about the reason why I wanted to join. It's been an absolute blast so far. Of course, some jobs are a lot cooler and more fun than others, but it's been a great experience. I I have no regrets. I just wish I would have went the active route sooner. Mm, okay. Yeah. Did you see much of a difference when you went from reserve to active duty? Oh, it's night and day. It's like two yeah. different languages. Yeah. Excellent. Well, very good. Uh, and when did you start developing a passion uh, towards leadership and communication? I think... I always had a passion for leadership as I was like in leadership positions on high school sports and, and throughout our ROTC program. But the more I read about it in, in books and in nonfiction books, and when I went for my MBA and started taking like some graduate level management courses, it's like, oh my goodness, there's a million different ways to skin mm. the cat and, and, and yeah. manage and lead. So I started diving into some of those reasons. I had some astounding professors that were very thought provoking and encouraged some conversation in class and just became an interest of mine throughout school. And then of course, going into the military, seeing those different things put into practice. Some, some mm -hmm. of them are great. Some of them were poor. In addition to some of the civilian experiences I've had with leaders, I'm like, this is really, it's just fascinating. It's like, there's such yeah. a, it's an art and a science, but like the science behind it it's just like, there's, there's really no right answer. There's like different mm -hmm. degrees of right answers. What's the most right answer? What's the most wrong answer? It just fascinated me that way. Yeah. You know, I, I liken it to chess in a way, you know, it's like you, the, the concepts are basic. You can learn, you can learn the basics in a day, but it's a light, it takes a lifetime to master because they're, because it's a, you know, it, you're dealing with people and, and people are, you know, essentially, you know, they're, they're, they, they're, they're unpredictable. <laughs> so you're right. dealing with all sorts of different issues. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's so many facets to leadership. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's 15,000 books been written on leadership. So we're, we're always trying to understand this thing, but, uh, and, but it is, it's a lifetime. I've been leading for 33 years and, uh, I'm still learning every day. I'm learning something. And, and so, yeah, it's fascinating that, um, like you said, every book, every video, every, uh, podcast, there's like one new facet of that gem that you didn't know about. And you're just like, wow, I, that's another tool in the toolbox, or that's something I need to try, or that's something that I didn't even un realize I was doing. So yeah, it's a constant lifetime of learning. Now for you, like, when did you decide, like, well, I'm gonna start writing about it. Like you started a newsletter, you started getting active on social media. Like that's a, that's a conscious decision when you say, like, I'm going to start writing on leadership issues. What was the trigger for you? Or why did you say, you know what, I'm going to start writing about these subjects? So I know I've always wanted to write a book and I, I've never really enjoyed something so much as to being able to go from start to finish in written format to write a book about it. And it was a conversation I had with, with one of my friends, Mike, we were talking about leadership and he's like, dude, you should just write a book about this. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't think I can. Like, there's no way. Me write a book, are you kidding me? And then as we were talking through it, I came to the realization like, holy crap. I, yeah, I think I can. I think mm -hmm. there's far less qualified people who have written books on leadership and other things. Like, so why not me? I had to get over that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I made the decision like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit to this. And worst thing that happens, nobody reads it and it stinks and it tanks. Like, I still wrote a book. It, it it's a good example for my kids that they can go on Amazon when I'm 70, 80 years old and my grandkids, et cetera. Like, look, there's, there's dad, there's grandpa. He wrote a book. He left his legacy on the world. And I can kind of go into, I can go into what his head was and what he was thinking at that time and who he was as a man, as a leader, just by reading this. So mm -hmm. as tacky as it sounds, doing it for my kids, I think was a big factor. I think it's I think it's really a, a, just a really good motivation. I know a good friend of mine. I've, I've known him. We've worked together for years, and his dad wrote a book like back, you know, I don't know, maybe forty years ago. Wrote a book, wow. uh, and I always thought that was really cool. And he 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 had copies of it. he had like like twenty copies that he he always had around. And I was always fascinated. Like your dad wrote a book. How cool right, is that? Right, you know? right. And and I always thought that like, well, that would be cool to write a book someday. You know, and. Uh, but it just seemed like one of those things, like you said, that like 
Well, those that's what famous people do, or that's what people yeah. who, you know, uh, college professors do, or people who are super educated. But I think uh, when it comes to leadership, I think, you know, all of our experiences are important to share because I think, like you say, they add to the body of knowledge of what leadership is and what it can be. So, yeah, I think it's great. I'm glad, I'm glad you know, I'm glad to see you're putting, you know, you're putting a, a book out there, 15,001 books now. On exactly. Right. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I added something to the, to the pie that someone can put in their toolkit. I think there's a couple, couple nuggets in there. Yeah. Oh, I bet. I'm sure, absolutely sure there is. So I I'm, mean, I'm looking forward to it when it comes out. So, uh, but I, I have a quick question for you, you know, you've worked because you were in the reserves and you, you, then you went active. So you, you've worked some civilian jobs too. So you've seen leadership and action in the civilian side and now, and you saw leadership and action in, in the military on active duty. What were some things that you saw, like maybe what were some contrasts that you noticed like from civilian to military leadership? So one of the big stereotypes is that all military leaders are just kind of hard slamming, putting the hammer down leaders and, and civilian leaders are not. And I can tell you, at least from my experience, and I had some jerk civilian bosses that were just <laughs> toxic and terrible yep. people. I'm talking about this guy and the stories in my book. He cornered me in the warehouse I was working at. And like, I thought he was going to harm me. He was saying oh, things yes. like, I saw what you get paid. You're not effing worth that. You know, F oh, wow. this, F that. And I'm just like, is this guy serious? And, and he was dead serious. And then, you know, telling HR about it. And they just, yeah, we can't do anything. This guy's too high in, of a level in this organization for us to do anything. And then I ended up finding another job. And they're like, how are you? Why are you leaving? I don't understand. Do you, like, Why don't you, you like leaving? it here? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And just like the... The ignorance and the, I want to call it naivety, but like, it, it, no, it was ignorance or, or I don't know. I don't know what the best word is. Negligence yeah. probably is a better word yeah, of yeah. them just choosing to not do anything. So I think I've had more positive leadership experience in the military than I yeah. did in the civilian world. That's not to say I met some in, insanely talented and servant leaders on the civilian side, because I have, I can handful right off the top of my head, but I've just been very blessed to be around some great thinkers who honestly care for those who work for them and put the needs of, of their team before their own. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too, because I get that a lot. They say, well, you're in the military, so you're used to command and control leadership. And I'm like, eh, no, I, not at all. I mean, uh, you know, if, if anything, you know, we're in the military, we're, we, we're working very close with our troops. I mean, yeah. well, in a submarine, we were very close, like we were day to day, you know, 24 seven, you know, months at a time, like couldn't get away from them. So we were, we had an intimate relationships with the people that we work with. So, uh, but, and, and I'm sure it's the same way on a unit, especially if you're deployed, you're, you know, and you're not going home every day. So you're just really close with the people you work with day in, day out, months on, months on end. And so you have to, you develop relationships. And I think what I found in the civilian world is that a lot of guys don't develop the relationship with the people they work with or, or the, or even workers to their bosses. They, they go home every night. They don't, you know, there's no, um, the connections are shallow. And so I do find that civilian leaders do treat uh, you know, treat people poorly because they can get away with it. They just go home sure. and they can they can ignore that individual, right? Whereas in the military, you, you sort of can't get away from it, you know, somebody because right. you're, you know, close quarters and, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's interesting. It's it's uh, the same similar observations I saw as well, too. And it's funny because, you know, it's like the Simon Sinek wrote a book, you know, Leaders Eat Last. And it's like, well, that's kind of like what we do in the military, Anyway, you know, that's kind of, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's service. It's old news, old news. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's like, oh, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. And it's like, oh, okay. You know, now that's like a book, you know, like I could have wrote that book. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so your book, let's talk about that. <laughs> Shut up and lead. Okay. So now obviously you're using, uh, in this, you know, the, let, let me read the, the subtitle. Cause I love it. It's, uh, it's how to speak softly and carry a big stick in a loud and obnoxious world. So obviously there's a Teddy Roosevelt speak softly and carry a big stick reference in there. So why did that resonate that, that philosophy resonate with you? And why do you think it's an important concept for leaders to understand? It resonates with me because not only is Teddy Roosevelt just an awesome dude, because yeah. like, look at all the cool stuff he did. He was actually, in my research, I, I discovered he was the youngest ever president 
I thought John F. Kennedy was, and he was the youngest ever elected president, but Teddy Roosevelt assumed the presidency um, after the assassination at a younger age than, than JFK did. But speak softly and carry a big stick. Just be so together, be so competent, be so squared away and good at your job and perform to that level and take care of those around you that people know that you're good. You don't need to tell them that, that you're good. You don't need to justify why you're asking people to do things like th- this guy knows what he's talking about. He gets results. So like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to follow him. And the speaking softly part is, you know, if you're going to be a leader who leads by yelling and demeaning and just going after and making personal attacks on people, like people are not going to want to follow you. Uh, mm. the, the borders along the lines of toxic, toxic leadership, what we call as non-productive leadership And if you have to do that to be effective, you obviously are not doing something right. So I've seen lots of leaders who like to yell and they may get results because, you know, strictly out of fear, people are going to do what they are, are being told to do. But the respect that those subordinates have for that leader is not there. And and they're going to, they're going to have resentment and they're not going to follow because they want to, they're not truly being inspired and led. They're just, they're being led out of fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you, you nailed something right there is that the, the, you know, the quiet, competent leader, people naturally gravitate to. Right. And I noticed that throughout my time uh, in, you know, working in corporate America, like I walk into a room, I, I automatically knew who was, who was the leader. Everyone defers to that person. Right. Right. And uh, and it doesn't matter what the rank is or it doesn't matter who, you know, what the position is. You notice right away when, you know, someone naturally takes the leadership position. Everyone defers to that person. But it's the quiet, competent uh, professional that knows what they're doing. And everyone's like, you know, like what's you know, what's Joe going to say? What is you know, what does Sharon think about that? You know, they're, they're defaulting to that leadership position because of competency uh, and, and skill and you know, sometimes, uh, you know, grace under pressure, you know, just, you know, being, being able to be when everyone's losing their minds, they're not, you know, that's right. It's, it's like, well, you know, like in, like, you know, in, in a battle scenario, when, when everyone's losing their mind, look to the person that's really calm because <laughs> yeah. that's, they, they're thinking about the next step, right. And everyone, everyone else is losing their minds. So I think that's a, uh, yeah, that's great. I mean, like you said, the the it's 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 you know it's natural. You know who the leader is. It's not rank. It's based on competency and you know ability. That's fantastic. And, and how can one be expected to effectively lead a group of people if he can't lead himself? You know, like if he's not oh, yeah. leading himself in his own way. So I think that plays into it too. Yeah, that, there's that's an important aspect too, and we don't talk about it enough. But leading yourself first is really important. I think people sense when you're physically fit, you're mentally capable, you're spiritually set up, you're financially, you know, uh, you're, if you have your, you know, it's um, a friend of mine talks about leadership being on stage. And he said, you know, he said, the other part, the most important part is to make sure the backstage is in order, right? And a lot of leaders, it's just chaos in the back, right? And then they try to get on stage and, you know, and then they're, and they're messing up their lines and things because they're thinking about all the things they got messed up in backstage, but you got to make, you got to get the backstage straight if you want to be good on when you're on stage. And I think self-leadership is a really big part of that. So good that yeah. you brought that up as well. And that's, that's a great, that's a great comparison. I, I never thought of it that way, but I'm definitely going to steal that from now on when I talk to people. Yeah. I, I've always loved the analogy, you know, because uh, you know, we are on stage as leaders and, and if we're worried about our relationship with our wife or our kids, or uh, we've got to, you know, we've got to lose 30 pounds or, you know, we're, we're not feeling good about ourselves physically. You're, you're, you're not going to be given hundred percent to your job. And I think you got to take that you got to take those steps and you have to have those, that discipline to take care of yourself, lead yourself first. And that's a big part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Did, did you read my book already? No, not yet. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, you're like, you're hitting like a lot of these things. I don't know if I get, if somebody leaked it to you, man. Oh my goodness. I know, but I figured you're into fitness. So I think this part of it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You hit the nail on the head. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. 
Leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them. Best-selling leadership author John S. Rennie knows this. That's why he's written a new book called You Have the Watch. It's a guided journal for leaders designed to take you through an entire year of leadership training. By the end of the year, you will master 50 of the most important leadership skills. If you want to have a greater impact on the results and people in your organization, go to youhavethewatch.com and pick up your copy today. This podcast is brought to you by Jeremy Clevenger Fitness. As a high-performing leader, you know that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about leading by example. And for most people, the one area they are lacking when it comes to leading by example is their health and fitness. By improving your health and fitness, every other area of your life improves. But how do you get and stay fit as a busy leader? Well, you do what you've always done. You hire the best person for the job. Now, don't struggle on your own. Put Jeremy Clevenger on your team. Jeremy will work with you to help take your physique, mindset, nutritional habits, and more to the next level with his step-by-step, all-inclusive coaching program. Now, I've worked with Jeremy for the past year, and I'm in the best shape of my life. So if you want to step up your game, reach out to Jeremy at jeremyclevengerfitness.com to find out more and get your initial consultation scheduled with him today. This episode is brought to you by the Fraternity of Excellence. The Fraternity of Excellence is an online and real-world community for men who are looking to improve in all areas of their lives. The men of FOE are working together to become better husbands, fathers, and leaders at work and in their communities. They live by a simple philosophy, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I've been a member for more than three years, and for me, I finally found a brotherhood of men that I was missing from my time in the military. Now, I love being around guys who are dedicated to becoming a better version of themselves. So if you're interested in becoming a man of excellence as well, go to fraternityofexcellence.com, or you can reach out directly to me to learn more. So when you, what do you talk, what do you mean when you say uh, we're in a loud and obnoxious world? I kind of think I know what it means, but what do you mean by that? So the introduction to my book is I, I just, I sat down and I just like brain dumped all this stuff mm-hmm. onto, onto the paper. And it was like about how I think social media as a whole, and generally mm-hmm. speaking, has been detrimental to leadership to, I mean, quite frankly, humanity. And uh, how we see so many people, and again, it doesn't apply to everybody, but if you're thinking, does this apply to me? It might apply to you, of people out there on social media, just so loud and obnoxious. And yeah. oftentimes they have nothing to back it up with. There are these, these empty threats through these anonymous accounts on social media who just say all these, make all these obnoxious claims with nothing to back it up. Mm. Do we want to be those kinds of leaders? Do we want to use those folks as examples for how we want to lead in our lives. I don't think so. We want to have the competence so that when somebody comes to us for help that we can deliver and help that person. And we're not just flapping our gums about how great we think we are or this and that we're just doing, we're doing more Mm -hmm. than we're talking about it. Yeah. I, I I agree with you a lot. In fact, I just want to hear as I struggle as an author and someone who's, who's trying to teach uh, and help people in leadership, uh, you know, the people that I work, you know, work with, they're like, well, you got to put your face out there more. You got to get more videos and more. And, and you know, my ver- view of leadership is not the only person. It's not about me. It's about my people, you know, right. and, and, and it's elevating them. And so it always feels weird to me putting my face in there. Look at me. Look how great I am. But but we do celebrate that in social media, in you know, in society in general. Right. The person that's up, you know, in, in your face and, you know, always their face is always on a video, you know, um, the influencers and, right. you know, and all these people that, you know, I, I look sometimes at, you know, the, just, just people, these Instagram models or whatever. And they, you look on their accounts and they have like 10 million followers. You're like, she just t- takes bikini pictures. What is going on here? And then people right. trying to teach and train on things that are vital towards, you know, business and society in general, the, you know, we're struggling to, to get our numbers up. Right. But, uh, but you, you, you do a little, you know, TikTok dance and you're like, you know, million views. <laughs> and then you can become a life coach right after that. You just, you know, self, <laughs> self-professed life coach and, and, and coach people twice your age on how to succeed and crush it at life. You know, like, yeah, yeah. You're on the same sheet of music that I am totally. 
Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's a frustration that I see as well too. So uh, yeah, interesting. Um, you know, one thing was interesting the, the way you wrote the book. You were very public about it. So you you uh, on Twitter you would you post like where you're at, how many how many uh, how many words you'd written, and and you you were kind of uh, and you actually allow people to see uh, like rough drafts, right? Uh, I think if they sign up for your newsletter, you can get see rough drafts of the book. Right. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about why you chose to do that very public, like I'm going to write a book and I'm going to, you're going to go along the journey with me. And I think that's a really interesting way to do it. So I did it for a few reasons. First, I wanted to inspire people mm-hmm. to, who are maybe thinking about writing a book. Maybe they thought they think they have some things to say and like, maybe I could write a book. Maybe I can't. And like, look, you're, you're, you're looking at a dude that has like, I'm not the life coach. I don't have 20 million followers on Instagram. What? I'm just a, I'm just a normal guy, and like I'm gonna try this and see if it works. I'll share my my trials and tribulations and successes, and and maybe I can help you out. If not, that's fine. Or maybe I can inspire you to write a book. That would be great. Hmm. And another reason was I wanted to paint a holistic picture of leadership for the readers for the final draft of the book. So the way I did it, I used Substack for my newsletter, and when I published the rough draft sections. It's kind of like a blog, like an old school blog from 10, 15 years ago. People can comment on there. People can post. People can make uh, – people can like and all that stuff. And I said, hey, share your stories if yeah. you've had anything similar like this happen to you. Because the, I don't want it to be just a military book where here's this army guy talking about all army things. Yep. And that will turn off 99% of the population who – was not in the military. So I didn't want to do that. So in addition to pulling in some of my civilian experiences, I wanted to share the experiences of some of the people who were going along on the journey with me. A lot of people graciously shared some of their experiences and you'll see those examples and stories scattered throughout the book. That's really cool. So it's almost like you're uh, crowdsourcing a a book, you know, in in a way, you know, you've got a subject matter, like a certain, you know, thing you're talking about, like, Hey, have you had these experiences in the past in your, in your, in your past? You hear these stories, you put it together, and now you're, it's almost like crowdsourcing, uh, yeah, the content in a book. Very interesting. Yeah, and kind of out of humility, and I make it, I try to make it very obvious, like I'm not the leadership expert. I've learned mm-hmm. some things, and maybe I'm further along on my journey than you are, but there's thousands, tens of thousands of people that are further along than I am. So I'm not the expert. Maybe you know some things reading my newsletter that I don't know. Hey, bring it to the table. Let's talk mm-hmm. about it and, and maybe put it in the book to get some other people a different point of view. I love that you said that because it's something I struggle with, and I and I and actually I I don't like the words expert and guru, right? And and I get <laughs> I get that a lot when I'm on podcasts. Oh, you know, John Rennie's a leadership expert. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm a student of leadership, but I am not an expert in in any way, shape, or form. And I'm learning every day, just like anybody else. I think. I think the great leaders are humble enough to know that they are not an expert and they are willing to listen to new ideas and listen to their people and, you know, and, and, you know, and have the right mindset that I, I don't know everything and, I'm, but yeah. there, are, there are things for me to learn. So I think I like that you say, I'm not a leadership expert, but that's the kind of book I want to read is, is someone that is on a journey and here's where I'm at so far. Here's what I've learned. And I have a long way to go, you know, and right. I think that's always been my approach. And so I kind of cringe when I get introduced was, you know, John Rennie, leadership expert, I'm like, ah, really expert. I mean, like experienced, sure, sure. <laughs> but right. expert, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's interesting. I love that. Um, now, uh, you one of the things I mean, you touched on it when we talked about it earlier, but this idea of competence and and. Um, you know, people gravitate towards the competent people. And, you know, you saw that in the military. I saw that in the military. I saw that in my civilian career. You know, sometimes we think it's, you know, it's about people or it's about plans or it's about our, uh, it's our vision. That's really important. But, you know, at the end of the day, people are going to, won't follow you unless you're competent, unless you, you have skill in the area of which you're leading. And so talk a little bit about the importance of competence. Yeah, just like you said, John, you have to know what you're doing if you're going to expect other people to to follow you in that field or hold them to a standard. How can you hold someone else to a standard in a subject if like you don't know what the heck you're even talking about? So, and then kind of like what we talked about, if you can't lead yourself or if you don't know what you're doing, how can you yeah. tell others what they should be doing? So just just kind of those two things. 
Yeah, I think it's really important. I think um, I know as a junior officer, when I first arrived on the submarine, I, I was not competent. I was uh, the Navy felt I was ready for the fleet. <clears throat> but, you know, I, you know, I surrounded myself with, you know, my my team had more years in the service and had more experience than I did and more education than I did. So how do you lead people when you're the least competent? Well, you better get competent quickly, you know, and so there was definitely pressure to become valuable to the team. And I think, uh, you know, that if so leaders, if you're in a position where you are not uh, a subject matter expert, you know, you should be relying on your subject matter experts, but also, uh, and you should be listening more than you're talking, but you also need to be learning quickly so that you can get the respect of your team because that's, they won't respect you if they see that you're not competent, right? And that's a big part of it. Yeah, and I think in our examples for the military, I mean, we get commissioned as officers and know nothing. We're essentially right, right. glorified privates or, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. I, always, I always forget the Navy ranks, but glorified E1s as, as we're O1s. Yeah, yeah. And we have those senior NCOs or yep. chiefs around us that have been doing their job in that field longer than we've been alive, quite frankly. Like, like you'll have some NCOs that have been doing it for 20 plus years and you need to get with them, leverage them, leverage those around you. And just because you're a leader doesn't mean you need to know all the answers, but you need to know where to go to find them. Yes. So leveraging yeah. those people, having them train you up, get up to speed as quickly as possible. And then you're leading from that position of competence. Hey, mentorship goes both ways. You can be mentored yes. by your subordinates as you should to your subordinates. Yes, the big that's a big nugget right there, people. If you're listening in, mentorship goes both ways. Absolutely, I learned so much from. I mean, my my first uh, chief petty officer was in the you know he was had been in the navy about as many years as I've been alive when I showed right. up to the boat. Like, how am I not going to listen to that guy? Seriously, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you you chief, keep me out of trouble. <laughs> right, basically, right. So yeah, I might outrank you, but you have much more knowledge in this than I do. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think there's. It takes humility to do that because the, the officers that didn't do that found themselves in trouble because they weren't humble enough to say, I'm willing to listen and learn from someone that 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 I outrank. Yeah. And then those subordinates with all the knowledge, they see that and they just kind of let that person go out and float on oh, yeah. their own island. And then, hey, not a team player. OK, roger that, sir. And then does not usually bode well for that person. No, uh, not at all. <laughs> so Absolutely. So uh, you say you also talk about trust and professionalism, and those are two big uh, characteristics you have to have as a leader as well. Talk a little bit about that. So for trust, uh, kind of get into it a little bit. There, there's different ways to go about trust in a leadership role. There's some leaders who give their undying 100% trust immediately, and then often you know they might get burned. And then there's people that say, you, know, you should never do that. You should come in and say, you have to earn my trust and mm. kind of start at the opposite spectrum. And then what I pose in the book is say, come in somewhere in the middle, 50-50. Yeah. Allow and empower your subordinates and trust them to a certain degree. But then the second part of that, which is vital, is to verify. Yeah. And as they show a pattern of continuing to do that successfully, you just kind of give them more and more and more trust or as you're just circling back, or maybe they're back briefing you once a day, once every other day of what they're at, where they're at, what they didn't do, what they owe you, and update accordingly. Yeah. And then, of course, if someone fails to meet that, then it goes the other way. I need to check on you more and more. Yeah. And then you get into kind of like a micromanaging position. Last thing you want to do, and that's unfortunately, you need to start doing the counseling of, hey, here's the standards. You're not meeting my standards, et cetera, that way. So that, that's that's how I, I talk about trust in the book. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I tend to go into it with a full glass. I think of it as a glass of water. I'll give you a full glass of water when I meet you, right? That's just how I am. I'm, I'm wired that way. And uh, and I I just assume you you filled the glass up. And uh, and then over time, I see if if your actions are consistent with that full glass of water. And what I find is some people... <laughs> Drain drain the water very yeah. quickly, and and that's a problem, right? So and uh, and others are like, oh, you know, oh, this is someone I can trust. This is someone that does what they say they're going to do, and that's 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 vital to me. It's it's actually my number one expectation. Do what you say you're going to do to my employees. I say, do what you say you're going to do. That makes it easy. If you say you're going to do something, you're going to it gets done. And uh, right, you know, that's a really nice way. 
uh, it's a great employee that does what he says they're going to do, he or she. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So you also say, obviously, integrity uh, is essential. Why is that? Integrity, I, I look at that as as similar to trust doing what you say you're going to do. It. And mm-hmm. as a leader, more so when I'm talking with my subordinates, so obviously it goes with my supervisor too. But if I say that I'm going to do something for you, team, or yeah. go, go to the plate for you, go to bat for you, or fight for resources for you, I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to, if that means I have to have a hard conversation with my boss to fight for my team, I'm going to do that for my team because I'm looking out for my team and protecting them. Of course, I would have that conversation respectfully, but building that trust and being a, a person of my word with my team is one of the biggest ways to to build that trust in me as their leader. And then that would go the other way too. They would see a leader doing that. Wow, this leader really has my back. I'm going to go above and beyond for, mm-hmm. for this guy or girl. Yeah, absolutely essential. Yeah, very good. So like, you know, there's a lot of books on leadership. What do you think is sort of like the unique thing people are going to take away when they read this book? The unique thing. So I mentioned at the beginning, the the five pillars of big stick leadership from 1900 when Teddy Roosevelt was was in leadership. And I, I tweak them a little bit to change them up a little bit and make them relevant for today. So there's still five principles. We mentioned some of them. I don't want to give them all away here because yes. I don't want to leave, leave a little carrot dangling. But I think it's a pretty unique and interesting way to take such an old philosophy that was written you know, at the beginning of the 20th century before social media, internet, cars, mainstream electricity, I think, and all that stuff, and apply it to a world in 2022 when we have like all that stuff and more. So I think readers readers will find that interesting. And more importantly, I hope they can take some some pieces of advice and maybe learn from some of my stories and put them into practice in their lives. That's fantastic. And I'm, I'm interested to see if this hundred year old philosophy stands the test of time. So that'll be interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. So when does the book come out? Comes out on January 6th. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we're a little bit out, but I want it to be, I want to polish it up a little bit more. And quite honestly, I didn't know how long the process was going to take because I've never written a book before. So I'm like, I'm going to give myself plenty of time so I can do it, you know, under promise, over deliver. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be worth the wait. Outstanding. So, and it is available for pre-order as I understand it, right? It is available for pre-order on Amazon. So get the ebook now, unfortunately the paperback, I cannot set up with pre-order for them on Amazon, but there will be a paperback available uh, when the book goes live on January 6th. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, how can people find out more about you, this book, and also we didn't mention, but your newsletter? Yeah. So to find out about what I have going on, there are three main things, all of which you can check out. Go to ianmroth.com, ianmroth.com. I had two short names, so it's really easy to remember. <laughs> Even my kids can do that on their little uh, iPads. But on there, you'll see the newsletter, that's one of the main buttons on there. It's a Substack newsletter. Subscribe to the newsletter. You'll get to see a rough draft of the book. Can engage with the sections and chapters of the book and see the book as it came out of my brain the first time onto, <laughs> onto paper. Kind of rough and uh, <laughs> unpolished, but I think it's it was a good exercise and I got, got a, a lot of good feedback from people who have read it. So there's the newsletter. Follow me on Twitter. I do drop a lot of hints about my book. That's at, at therealroth.com, therealroth, R-O-T-H, kind of like the IRA. Huh. And then the third way is to go on Amazon and pre-order the book. There's a description on there. It goes a little bit more into what the book's about. And if you think that's something that interests you, hit that pre-order button and I would be forever grateful. Okay, fantastic. We're going to put links in the show notes for all those resources. So you don't have to write it if you're driving right now. So we'll do that. So let me just encourage all of you to take a look at this book. It's called Shut Up and Lead, How to Speak Softly and Carry a Big Stick in a Loud and Obnoxious World. Uh, Ian, this has been uh, wonderful having you on the show. Thank you for coming on the show, sharing this uh, new book, sharing your new your philosophy and uh, and helping us uh, bridge the gap for a hundred year old philosophy, bring it into the future. This is really exciting. Thanks for being on the show. John, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And as always, you know, I love seeing your stuff and listening to your, your shows on here. So keep up the good work, man. <laughs> I will. Thank you very much. 
Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Welcome to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing, where we harmonize your mind, body, and soul. I'm Amanda, your sound therapy expert. And I'm Stephen, the curious explorer uncovering the mysteries of sound. Together, we explore vibrations, frequencies, and the power of sound therapy and tuning forks. Discover ancient wisdom, reduce stress, and tune into a healthier life. Subscribe to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing today. Welcome to Ringside with Ray and Prince. My name is Ray Leonard Jr. Oh, is that my name is Prince Daniels Jr. Daniels again with a big hole. Touchdown! On this show, we come to humanize athletes, entertainers, business executives. We're going to see what makes them tick. Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there. Peace and power. Electric acid.